would like to, to address a question to the audience, the first I do. And how many of you in this room know someone in your uh, close relations who has been giving a gene therapy? Hands up. Well, zero. I'm not surprised uh, because gene therapy is still very exclusive. But in, sorry, but in um, some, f if I ask the same question five years from now, I'm sure that I will see more hand raised. My name is Peter Ekolind, and I'm started as a CEO for CombiGene in about the 1st of September, actually, so it's quite new. We have a vision, as you can see, uh, and we also have a disclaimer. We are listed on the 1st North. Gene therapy, well, it's new possibilities. <coughs> Sorry. And in, <coughs> and in CombiGene, we have four projects, one in epilepsy and one in lipodystrophy. It's a very rare disease. And then we have a quite new pain program with two different options. I will come back to that later on. But gene therapy gives... Oh, sorry. Um, Combigene has a solid knowledge in, in drug discovery and gene therapy. But even though we know that not all of the projects that we are working with in drug discovery will come to clinical uh, studies or even reaching the market, we need to look for more assets, more projects. And that's what we are constantly doing in, in Combigene. This is what I was talking about, sorry. Um, I will also show you our business model. It's a, uh, quite straightforward with a um, inlicing phase. We are looking for assets from research, researchers, academia, or from companies. And our lipodystrophy project is coming from Lipigon, and the pain project is from the Danish company Cenero. When we have in licensed the assets, we start working with the development phase. And here is our core competence. We have lots of good project leaders who are very skilled in drug development. And what we are putting together is a kind of proof of concept for the preclinical package. And when we have that, we, s we start to approach big pharma and try to out-license the uh, object or, or project to them. And when it's from here we have the revenue stream coming in, <coughs> in down payments and, and uh, different milestones. And it's here that we create value for our share owners. A second question. I guess I will have more hands in the air. I was asking, because I'm moving over to our pain project, how many in the audience know someone who have chronic pains? Hands up. Yes, I suppose so because that's meaning that this audience reflects what we can see in the society, that approximately one-fifth of the adult population suffering from chronic pain. And that's cost the society a lot of money, as you can imagine. If we look at the chronic pain from a patient perspective, there is a lot of symptoms associated with the pain, and that, at the end, leads to a significant reduced quality of life. You can't work, you can't uh, be socialized with friends, and you constantly have your pain breaking your, your uh, physiology, physiology. But what does it mean from, from a societal perspective? 
if you take this one-fifth that have chronic pain and go down and see who have severe chronic pain, you will notice that still it's not 20, 25 percent, but still it's 7 to 8 percent who are suffering from severe chronic pain. That means that you probably can't work anymore, and, and that drives a huge amount of cost for a society. And in this is estimation in the US, you can see that it, the pain is calculated to be around 635 million US dollar per year. That's more than what cardiovascular cancer and diabetes cost the society. So it's huge costs. And the today's pharmaceuticals are insufficient. They are not designed to help patients with chronic pain. It's a general painkillers, but it doesn't help the specific the the, mo the mechanism of behind uh, chronic pain. So there is a need for a new approach to chronic pain. And in this program, COSI, which is the collaboration we have with Sinero in Denmark, the researchers there have found out that in a normal pain signaling, this is a neuron, you can see that the, the pain signal is going through the green receptors here, and that's fine. You should feel pain. But those patients who have a chronic pain, they have extra receptors, the red ones here, making the signal much more amplified. So even a light stimuli, a light touch, can end up in a severe pain signaling for the patients. And if you're then giving traditional painkillers, it will be like a filter. It filters away a lot of the signaling, but it, it doesn't give complete pain relief. And you also make a lot of other problems while, while you're filtering the signaling. The solution here with the COSI program is that we are um, giving, uh, giving the patient a, a PIK1 inhibitor because the PIK1 is the reason for putting more receptors on the surface. And when we're blocking that, we will restore the normal pain signaling in the neurons. The pain program COSI consists of two treatment modalities, but it's one the same mechanism of action in, 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 in these two different compounds. One is uh, the COSI-01, it's a peptide, and the peptide you can give like a supercutaneous, subcutaneous injection like insulin and, and get pain, pain reduction. But if you have a chronic severe pain, where you don't think that you will get rid of the pain, then you can use the second one, the COSI-02, which is a gene therapy targeting this patient's pain condition. And in fact, the gene therapy makes the cells to produce the peptide. So we have the same mode of action, and you can also use the peptide to, to test and try and see if the patient are responding on that before you give this more expensive gene therapy treatment. The researchers in Copenhagen, where this come from, they have tested this in several pain models. So we know it works in different kind of pain models like this. But we also know that we have a persistent effect for over a year with after one dose of the gene therapy, the CoCO2. So to finalize this, uh, I would say that gene therapy is, oh sorry, is on the rise. We will see more of gene therapy in the future. The CoCO, the COSI program is a new way of treating chronic pain, and there is a significant need for that so badly that the uh, NIH in US have funded a special program 
called Preclinical Screening Platform for Pain, just to find out where can we, where, what kind of new substances can we use without addiction. And COC is in that program for evaluation. And in Combigene, we have a strong ambition to license additional gene therapy assets, as I mentioned. We are a strong team with a track record of outlicensing to big pharma. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, you, you started off by saying you, you asked people to raise their hands if they knew anybody using gene therapy and nobody raised their hands. Why did nobody raise their hands? Because still it's a very exclusive therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it will be an exclusive therapy as well in the, in the future, I guess, even though I think that the manufacturing cost will go down and, 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 and there will be more... Eval um, uh, you will have more specific gene therapies so we can have smaller doses and so on. Mm -hmm. But there is a lots of no novel gene therapies coming out to the market. Right. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about why gene therapy is so promising? Well, I think what you can do with gene therapy is that you can replace a, uh, a malfunctioning gene or if it's lacking and you can have Th those function back in 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 in, in the in, at, uh, in 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 the patient, but you can also, as I'm, as you saw with the C uh, CoCO2, you can actually build in a, a pharmaceutical industry in your body, mm -hmm. the producing the kind of peptides or whatever you want or need. Mm -hmm. So a lot of potential in that yeah. sense for yeah. sure. Um, just looking at some questions that I'm getting here, uh, you, you talked uh, right at the end about wanting to in, in license projects. And when looking at in licensing, what are you ma mainly looking for exactly? We are look, looking for early projects and sp preferably where we have core competences, and that's it in CNS and metabolic diseases. Mm -hmm. But we are uh, quite flexible. If you find something that are interesting, we, we looked into it that, of course. And um, another question I have here, w what's the expected up uptake of gene therapy for pain patients? Uh, it, it's a double, there are actually two questions in one here. So I'll let you answer that. What's the expected uptake of gene therapy for pain patients? For, for the gene therapy, you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you have to uh, notice that some patients have uh, chronic severe si pain situation. And they, like if you have an amputation and you have phantom pains, there will be very little success for that to vanish. That could be a typical patient that could benefit from, from a gene therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the second part of the question is, which percentage of patients do you expect to be ready to embark on a gene therapy product? It's very oh, that's a difficult question. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I can't tell you right now. Fair enough. Um, how do you plan to attract future partners and what is your strategy for building successful partnerships? I think we, we evaluate a lot of assets and I think what we are being better and better off is that we we put in the commercial aspects of the assets bef like more e more interesting than the scientific part of it so if gene therapy normally addresses small and narrow patient groups mm -hmm. but i think there is a s uh, swift to larger patient groups mm -hmm. in the future well, great. Well, thank you so much for answering the questions and thank you for your presentation, Peter. Thank you.